Hello and welcome everybody to this um, Practice as Research seminar. Um, it's, um, I think it's number three um, in this series. And today I have got with me um, Dr. Ross Purvis, who is going to be talking about ethical dilemmas in 20th century British music education history research. Ross is an associate professor for music education here at the Institute of Education at UCL. And he's a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy. He was previously senior lecturer in education at the De Montfort University in Leicester where he led mu model modules in music and arts education, computing and educational technology. Um, Ross has presented um, research at various UK and European education and music conferences, and he's an experienced performing musician and arranger. Between 2016 and 18, he was a member of the Musicians Union Teachers Section National Committee. Quite a mouthful to say, I have practiced it, but I'm still struggling to get over that. <laughs> and he currently serves on the Music Education Committee of the London Music Fund. He's a school governor of Bedford Road Primary School, and um, he's obviously a very, very busy per person. He has um, received the, the De Montfort University Vice Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Award in 2017 and 2018. His research interests include various aspects of music education, instrumental learning, um, the application of GIS and geospatial analysis to education research, um, children's computer programming, education and creative applications of Lego and making, the history of education, um, initial education, early career transition and professional development. But today, he's not going to talk about any of those things. Um, today, I have asked him to kindly come along and really talk um, to the Practice as Research Network um, about the ethical issues in his work. And I think that's something that's that's often, um, you know, for kind of forgotten. A lot of the time ethics is seen as, as this tick box exercise where we get ethical approval. Um, but obviously when you do research like Ross does, especially when you use things like technology um, and people, um, then obviously there are a lot of ethical issues that we do have to consider. Um, and when I kind of put that to, to Ross, Ross was then coming back to me and saying, actually, I want to talk about history research. So I was thinking, mm, not quite what I had envisaged. But then I saw the brief of what's going to happen. And I thought, yes, that's perfect for our um, purposes here. So with no further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand over to Ross. As always, um, please feel free to put any questions into the comments box and the chat box. Um, and we obviously have an opportunity later to discuss. Um, and yeah, enjoy, enjoy what you're going to see. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for that uh, very nice introduction, Nicole. Um, and I uh, hope everyone can see the slides uh, and fingers crossed even hear a musical example shortly. So uh, we'll, we'll uh, hope for the best on that. So thank you all for coming today. I'm going to talk for around 20 minutes and then have a brief um, break for any discussion or questions and then, and then pick up the last five to 10 minutes after that. Um, and then we can have some further discussion as needed. Um, so I'm going to reflect on some ethical dilemmas um, relating to two ongoing research projects uh, into aspects of 20th century British music education history. Both have made significant use of technology and I'm going to mention some of the benefits and creative possibilities of technological uh, or technology mediated research um, but then I'm also going to focus on some of the potential blunders and ethical dilemmas that I've encountered along the way and in the spirit of practices research I want to reflect on my processes in this presentation as much as the actual um, outcomes or in fact more than the outcomes of research really so in the first project i'm investigating the lives of four individual musicians whose names are listed on a 1909 violin exam certificate and i'm using this as a launching off point for exploring various career and life histories along with a range of associated musical and educational movements organizations and trends in the late Victorian, Edward, Edwardian and earlier 20th century periods. It's been a really very rich project so far because it's thrown light onto whole areas which have been neglected in standard top-down accounts of English music education history. 
In the second project, I've been collating data from a series of annual yearbooks published between 1939 and 1955. And these list senior staff from all UK local education authorities, along with job titles, gender, salutations and post-nominal qualifications. So transcribed into a database, these listenings represent an unparalleled means of tracing the rapid expansion of this important branch of music education. And the legacies of these staff and the teams they appointed was an infrastructure of municipal music services and instrumental and vocal tuition schemes that have endured with varying fortunes and in various guises to the present day. So the power of a database like this lies in the ability to cross-reference with other data sources, such as the vast resources of the British newspaper archive. I want to make it clear that I'm not in any way presenting myself as an expert in any of these areas um, of ethical considerations. I don't have all the answers, and I felt my way in these projects as they've developed. I don't think I've got everything right, and I'll mention some of the potential missteps today as honestly and candidly as I can. I'm also going to uh, pose a fair few uh, rhetorical questions, and I hope uh, we can consider these in the discussion that will follow. Um, <clears throat> so let's start with some of the ways that uh, technology... Let's start with some of the ways that... I'll, I'll play the piece and then we'll talk about it after. So um, I'll explain what that was an extract from. Um, one of the ways that technology has been of great benefit in um, the project of the exam certificate is that I've been dealing with lots of very old and largely forgotten sheet music where no recordings exist. Uh, it includes music either performed or composed by those referenced on the certificate. So using scanning and optical score recognition software, I've been able to generate passable realizations of these scores uh, in the computer, bringing these pieces back to life for presentations. So the example you just heard was um, originally performed in the village where the exam candidate lived in 1909. And it's from a, a village production of a piece which is long forgotten called The Wishing Cap. It's a fairy operetta. Um, <clears throat> and happily in the local history archive, they still had the conductor's score for this uh, work. And uh, I was able to produce recordings of this using optical uh, scanning, uh, score scanning technology um, in order to realize it. So they could hear this piece in the village um, where it was performed 100 years before. I'm fairly certain for the first time in 100 years. Um, <clears throat> here's another example of how technology has been really useful in my work. Um, in the second project, the yearbook project, it's involved transcribing directory listings of music staff into a database. Once it's in a database, I can then use a structured query language, SQL or SQL, to interrogate the data in very flexible ways, including exporting it to mapping applications and graphing the results. So I can look at things over time, see how appointments were made in different areas, and I can graph results and look at things quantitatively from that uh, raw data. So these are just two examples of technology enriching my research, my historical research, and enabling a rich sensory engagement and fresh analytical insights. But despite these benefits, I've come to realize that the immediacy and the sheer power of contemporary technology may also entice the researcher towards rash, inaccurate, or sometimes ethically complex actions. And in particular, whilst these are both historical projects, they're not that historical, since both focus on events in the past century or so. My view is that technology serves to warp this relatively small passage of time still further, bringing forgotten events to the fore and linking past lives to the present in potentially unexpected ways. So I've grouped the issues I want to discuss into two 
uh, headings, duties of care to the living and obligations towards the deceased. And I'll mention also um, various other responsibilities towards the historical community um, in both academic and local history senses and to society more generally, perhaps. Um, and I'm going to talk about the first one, then we'll have a short break to discuss things and then pick up the second. So <clears throat> with regards to duty of care to the living, in both projects, there are still likely to be people alive who are involved in these stories. And I'll illustrate the implications with two scenarios. Using public death records, it's been possible to establish that the four individuals named on the exam certificate, that's the candidate herself, plus her teacher and the two examiners, died between 1924 and 1964. Since the candidate was the youngest person named and the most recent to pass away, it will be the case that close descendants are still alive and they may even remember her. So this causes us to ask important questions about the ethical responsibilities I have to her family, her living family. And in the case of the yearbook project, the vast majority of individuals in my database will now be de deceased. However, once we get to the mid 1950s, it's just possible that transcriptions will cover those still living. For instance, on the basis of an entirely possible 100 year lifespan, the 1955 volume could contain data on individuals now aged in their mid 80s. I'll consider the implications of this scenario first and then come back to the matter of family descendants in a moment. If you're not from the UK or EU, you might not be aware of the data protection regulations that govern <clears throat> our use of personal data in these territories. And this implementation of the general uh, data protection regulation or GDPR in 2018 was a watershed in this respect, since it applies as soon as one begins, begins collecting personal data on living individuals. Um, and the definition of personal data is wide ranging. So as a result, I've had to assume that GDPR applies um, and limits the uh, and it's limiting the potential of living, including limiting people, uh, living people in my research. It's one of the reasons why at the minute I'm only um, transcribing the databases up to 1955. Uh, the personal data I'm collecting doesn't fall into the category of what's called sensitive data, but still embraces names, salutations, post nominal qualification letters, job titles status, employer, length of time employed. And I'm storing all of this data, therefore, in encrypted password protected files. And I have a privacy notice uh, linked from my UCL webpage just to ensure all the bases are covered on this. So <clears throat> despite being openly published in the past, these yearbooks constitute secondary data and they're still likely to be in copyright. So due consideration also needs to be given to the respectful use of the data in ways which are congruent to the original intentions of the compilers and of the individuals who submitted the information for inclusion. The yearbooks in question were published by the Association of Education Colleges. Um, this body ceased to exist in its original form in 1977. However, a charitable trust still operates to administer, administer its legacy financial affairs, and I obtained written permission from its chair to use these yearbooks for the research. On the tricky matter of consent, the chair was of the view that the actual information will be the intellectual property of each individual person involved, who, by definition, uh, he commented, has willingly put, put it into the public domain for the benefit of colleagues in the education service. So on balance, my judgment was that my research remains pretty congruent to the original aims of this publication and its contribution. Now I want to return to the issues associated with family descendants. And in my view, these are actually considerably more ethically tricky. This is because both of these projects force me to acknowledge the inherent tension between my position as an ethic researcher uh, since I have no direct links to these historical individuals, and my goal of generating rich narrative accounts of individuals' lives and music-making activities. So to this end, I must consider the unintended consequences uh, and impacts on living descendants, and in particular their life narratives. Now, Holly Cross and White is a British researcher who's written on the ethical issues associated with piecing together um, historical lives from archival sources. And she notes that life Narratives can be important to descendants of the deceased, as they can be a reminder of the individual's character, but they can also be a basis for a descendant's own life narratives. Now, I'm not saying that family members themselves couldn't undertake the kind of research that I'm doing. They definitely could, and given the explosion in interest in family history research in recent years, they quite possibly are. They can access the same publicly available sources and archives and use the same online tools as me, such as the British newspaper archive and Ancestry.com. But one could argue that when family descendants undertake these processes themselves, they are working through the information they encounter piece by piece. 
gradually coming to know their ancestors over time and with opportunities to reflect consciously and subconsciously on what they've discovered. Their life narratives evolving gradually in response and in, in the context of white, what might not already be known about these individuals. In contrast, by constructing accounts of aspects of their lives, I'm potentially creating composite descriptions of them, which might in some cases go beyond the awareness of family members. And should these family members encounter these accounts, perhaps online or a presentation such as this, um, it risks having them uh, digest a great deal of information all at once, potentially with a more sudden uh, and even disrupting impact on their life narratives. And this is, of course, in addition to the realisation that their family history has been the subject of investigation by a, a third party researcher. Well, what might the implications of these kinds of activities be for living descendants and their own life narratives? Well, on one hand, my research into this exam certificate is focused on a non-controversial legal historical topic. It seems therefore unlikely that making inquiries about their ancestors will cause any distress to descendants or provide them with new information which disrupts their existing life narratives. But when one doesn't have to dig far into the story to find issues such as divorce, which were viewed very differently in the 1920s and might still come as a surprise to some descendants today. Grandchildren and great grandchildren will certainly still be alive. And as Cross and White observes, grandchildren could still be using their ancestors' life narrative within their own lives and sharing it with newer family members. It's also likely that these living descendants had a personal contact with the individual, which could strengthen their value of their ancestors' life narratives. Cross and White also cautions researchers of recent historical eras to make personal connections with the individuals they discover. She says that such connections will help remind them that individuals from the past may still live in the present through their own shared life narratives and family memories. And it's to those very special personal identities that our researchers should observe a duty of care and ensure that they do not produce a researcher created life narrative that can harm those that care for the memory of that individual. Now, here's a very good example of this from my research, and, and it urges us to ask the question, just because you can Google it, should you? Um, and I was searching for some names uh, for the names of the exam candidates, family members, which I knew thanks to census information. Perhaps I would find something interesting about their family life and music making in the 1910s and 20s. However, what I found was an online uh, obituary page, and this isn't it. This is a this is a mock up. I won't say exactly when this obituary was from, but suffice to say that I found this page in nine, in 2019 and the death it documented was near enough in date to be quite a shock. On this page, I was confronted with a picture of an elderly lady, the offspring of the exam candidate, along with contributions recounting this individual's life, including musical activities from a variety of close relatives. And this suddenly brought home to me the closeness of this topic, both in terms of the time and the people concerned. It reminded me of how much I had come to feel like I knew the individuals listed on the certificate, but also how this now felt like a, an intrusion into family life. As it happens, I'm not the only researcher to have looked at online obituary pages. Such pages have actually proliferated in the past couple of decades, both on dedicated websites, such as this one from Co-op Funeral Care, and also online shrines hosted on Facebook. And I have to say that many researchers appear to have been untroubled by the ethical implications of looking at these things, uh, either in terms of the impact on the legacy of the deceased subject or on those who leave in the emotive tributes on them. In fact, a 2022 review um, of 89 of these kinds of studies found that four out of five had not sought institution ethical approval at all, and over half didn't mention ethical considerations in any way. Many of these studies claim that ethical approval was not needed because data was already public. Even if efforts had been made to anonymize contributions on these immemorial sites, often they quote verbatim, um, posts that people have made about people on these on these sites, which means, of course, it's very easy to do a reverse lookup of those quotes and find the original um, page on on uh, the internet. Should you have the inclination? So, in terms of my research agenda, it would, of course, be quite helpful to be able to cite this online source because it's it raises interesting questions of musical development and how one generation passes musical experiences onto the next. Um, and the value of formative family experiences in future music making. So it's a really it's a really nice example of music through the generations. But I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do anything except give the barest information such as I'm doing today, um, because I find the thought of quoting particular information from this memorial deeply uncomfortable. 
indeed after finding this page i stepped back perhaps even slightly ashamed although i wasn't to know that i would um what i would find when i, when I clicked on this link it felt like it was crossing a boundary and intruding even though of course these comments have been placed in the public sphere by the family yet they haven't been placed there for use as research source material and that's the ethical sticking point in my view the same could be said about the use of resources made available uh, via online genealogy portals such as ancestry.com I've used these a lot uh, in the exam certificate project, mainly because the companies behind these platforms have typically licensed huge numbers of official records, census returns and registrations of births, marriages and deaths. Sure. But also these sites enable and encourage user contributions, typically in the form of additional information provided directly by family members on the ancestors they're investigating. And the line between what might be termed official records and material shared by families can be blurred. But I'm far less comfortable about using the latter for the same reasons as the online obituary material. So what can be done to reduce any possible negative impacts on family descendants and also perhaps reduce my anxieties as an ethic researcher? Well, one thing is to make reasonable efforts to publicise my work in the hope of potentially making contact with living family members. This, of course, brings its own ethical issues, but in principle has a number of possible benefits, uh, including explaining what I'm doing, emphasising the work is a process and that family members are able to contribute if they wish, and that the research is being done with families and not about families. Um, the research will be made far richer by the additional information, photographs and other material that families might wish to make available. Um, should contact be made before I publish anything, family members could have uh, opportunities to review drafts. And should contact be made after publication, then project outputs could be shared and reassurances given about the efforts that I've made to contact them during the processes. So in the case of my examination research, examination certificate research, whilst I don't need their permission in a sense, um, for all these reasons, I view attempting to reach out to them as more than an ethical courtesy. Consequently, I have ethical approval covering this potential of contact awarded by UCL. I haven't made contact as yet, and I'm realistic about the likely success in relation to the this project, not least because this is unfunded research and opportunities to generate publicity and undertake extensive tracing are inevitably limited. To date, my light touch efforts have um, included posting messages on a range of popular inter, um, genealogical forums, internet genealogical forums, displaying posters at local museums and libraries and sharing information about my work via local history groups. Such contact with the living does, of course, bring us squarely back into the realm of standard human research ethics, including volunteer participation, withdrawal and informed consent. But there are particular issues relating to the disclosure of personal or confidential information here. On the one hand, I remain cognizant of the Royal Historical Association's advice that researchers should take particular care when evidence is produced from those still living, when the anon anonymity of individuals is required and when the research concerns those still living. These, this seems like obvious advice, but it's harder to achieve in this case than might first be thought, given that descendants might share the same family name as those being investigated. Um, opportunities to review and discuss drafts of research outputs are intended to give participant reassurances uh, regarding the minimization of embarrassment to them or their families or their memory of their deceased ancestors. Should any um, objections be raised, I envisaged reviewing these this content together with the intention of negotiating a documented narrative which is acceptable to all parties um and there's likely to be no hard and fast guidelines for this kind of negotiation as edwards and weller have written in this very interesting account of what happened in their research when a, a participant died halfway through their research um, negotiating a course of action for dealing with an ethical dilemma is not necessarily a final resolution rather it's a contingent process which is something that Nicole mentioned at the beginning um, in which actions to address one ethical dilemma can create or raise another subsequent ethical dilemmas so a further um, consideration is of um, is that by engaging with my research any family descendants might become more inquisitive regarding their family history in the pub in the UK public interest in genealogy has written in risen in parallel with the growing population popularity of TV shows like BBC's Who Do You Think You Are? A correlation which uh, Fenella Cannell has noted draws attention to family history as a form of care for the dead and a moral terrain in which the English living and dead mutually co constituted as relatives. Um, 
So in response, I prepared signposts to accessible resources that could support further family history research should this process have piqued their interest. Um, I'd also mentioned that I'm working with um, local history groups on the exam certificate research. And I find this incredibly helpful for me as a researcher. And it's one of the reasons why I characterize this particular project as practice as research. Um, in the absence of contact with the families concerned, I've found that it, this can be an effective way of bringing additional authenticity to the research due to the positionality of these groups. In one case, um, an extremely active local history society in the small town where uh, one of the individuals on the certificate lived um, has functioned something akin to a culture bearer, which is designed as a resource, which is defined as a resource person who's a member of the culture being represented or studied. And this group holds deposits formerly owned by the family in question, and older members recall some of the family descendants before they left the area. And um, I'm doing another presentation uh, in January, and I'm pleased to say that my colleagues on that presentation are here with me on the call today. Uh, it's going to be a musical presentation. Um, and it's in the cemetery uh, where some of the individuals involved in this research are buried. And in fact, as a result of my interest in them and this family, they've they've cleaned up the friends of that cemetery, have cleaned up their graves and so on. So it's it's a really nice kind of um, visceral piece of research that's, that sort of draws me draws me in. So I'm going to pause there. Uh, that's the end of my first section. Second section is shorter. Um, and I'd be very welcome to pick up any comments or questions at this point that anyone would like to raise. Thank you very much, Ross. And yes, there have been um, a couple of comments already. Um, so I'm going to ask Nicholas to unmute yourself, please, and come in at the stage. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. Yeah, great. Hi, Ross. Thank you for that. That's um, very interesting. Um, fascinating, fascinating set of things. Uh, one thing that struck me when you were talking about the um, uh, issues of family narrative um, and their own construction of, of their, um, their relatives was the issue that because as a researcher you might publish something, you know, the nature of publication somehow conveys a perceived authority and that there's a conflict potentially there um, between the kind of narrative as constructed by the researcher. I mean, you talked about kind of the amount of information coming at them, but I was thinking of it more in terms of the, almost the power relationship that um, that, that, that is perceived to exist. It doesn't necessarily actually exist, but it's perceived to exist perhaps by those outside the research community, that here is a researcher with all their expertise. They have said this, this must therefore be yeah. how uh, my relative was yeah. rather than, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, the, the constructed family narrative of it, of it, as it were, that you were, you were talking about earlier. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very good point. Um, and I, just before I answer that, I'll say thank you very much for joining us, Nicholas. Nicholas is, is a great friend and colleague of mine, in the, and we have worked specifically on ethics. And actually, what my interest in thinking deeply in this area has been inspired largely by Nicholas. So I'm very <laughs> grateful for your time and your question. Um, so a good a good example of that tension, right, is when I was when I've been advertising, you know, that I'm doing this work and I, I, hoping to get to speak to people. I agonised about whether I would say on it that I've put on it. Um, piece of historical research by dr ross Purvis of ucl which you know that's kind of like foregrounding me as as the as the big guy right um but i i was agonizing about that because i thought i want to make it clear that this is this is the proper thing i'm doing i'm you know this is not just me messing around this is me as a professional coming into this and wishing to do a really good job with professional resources and with good training etc behind me um so I wanted to give that sort of reassurance and confidence. Uh, but at the same time, I realized that it might make me seem like I was setting myself up on that, on top, on, you know, over, um, which, which was a tension. I, and I'm, so I'm very grateful of you recognizing that. Um, I think that uh, it, I felt that it wasn't really the family, but when I did, when I did this presentation um, in the town, um, I certainly felt like um, I had a lot to prove that and I've, I felt a lot of pressure to do on that presentation because there were people in that community in their 80s and and so on and who would remember some of the people involved and you know I was talking about their town and their and their context um and uh, I took very great care to um ensure that I was talking about it in a in a way which matched their their view of the world 
as far as I could. But I think I think you're right. I think that and that if it happens, uh, if I do make contact with these families, then um, I'll have to cross that bridge. It'll be one of those contingent decisions mm. where we work together on that. Um, but I, I think it's a live issue and I, I don't have any other direct solutions at this stage no i mean I, I agree with you i think it's a very difficult thing to do um can i just pick up a quick follow-up on that um mm. kind of tangential almost but um i was thinking about what you were saying about the sort of starting to try and involve the families and so on and i was wondering whether you perceive that as a a change in your initial research method or whether you see it as it being encompassed within the overall project and i'm thinking of this as much as anything from the perspective of um a researcher coming in and starting with the idea that they're going to look at data and then kind of inadvertently wandering into you know through through good intention and good practice and thinking oh well now i've got this data i should go and talk to the families and perhaps not necessarily realizing that their methods are changing as they encounter the ethical issues and i, I just wonder whether you see that as you know it, was that your trajectory or was your trajectory that you anticipated all of this up front um you know just is some of it you haven't done yet and some of it you'll get to or whether it's a more emergent emergent thing i think i think i anticipated elements of it because um i found this difficult local to where i live so uh, something i'm talking about at the end i i knew that i would have access to local history resources and things within my immediate area so i thought it was a reasonable possibility that i would come into contact with people who would have who would be on the inside um, but it was only, you're quite right, it was only when thinking about it more carefully and for, for an ethics application that I actually formalised some of that um, mm. and thought about it methodologically um, and thought about and then started reading about it and, you know, and thinking about the value of that participation, the two-way value of that participation. So, yeah, it was... Um, it, it 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 was a bit of both but definitely once i formalized it which is uh, you know why nicole's here as our chair of <laughs> research ethics committee and so i you know i always find filling out an ethics form is very helpful and useful because it, it forces you to actually engage with these issues yeah I mean, I think uh, it's very, I it's gonna, very interesting. So, go. On. Sorry, I was just going to come in here very briefly to kind of say that actually at at IOE, um, we do have um, a process whereby all all data collection counts as research. So, it, you know, even even if somebody kind of thinks, well, we are entering, um, you know, this is only secondary data analysis, or it's only a systematic review, or it's only looking at. At, at some yearbooks from from years ago, actually, that still constitutes research in our um, definition, and therefore requires an ethical approval. Um, and I know many other universities don't do that because they they think it's low risk, and therefore you don't have to go through the ethics process. So I think that's probably why, um, like Ross said, you you kind of have to think sort of probably through those things as you as you fill in the form because you have to fill it anyway. Um, you see what I mean? So I don't think yeah, yeah. I don't think you can I don't think for IOE researchers it's very easy that they happen inadvertently to add um, something that they hadn't thought of before because they would have done an ethics reform um, ethics application form um, which would have been approved and then obviously as they you know potentially want to change things they go through an amendment process but that's so instilled in our way of working that. I don't think, and you know, the inadvertent sort of thing can happen. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I was thinking of it partly from outside. I'm the co-chair of the computer science rec at uh, UCL, and obviously we see a lot of machine learning and things like that, which is very data driven. Yes. Um, <laughs> and I think it's an area we're quite we on the committee at least are quite sensitive to around the drift of methods. You know that you start with data yes. and you might do the clearance on the data but it's then easy to drift into these other methods without really uh really thinking it through anyway i've, I've taken up lots of time here but thanks ross that's that, Thank it's all you. absolutely right. fascinating i think Thank just to anticipate my conclusion i think one of the things i want to say about technology is i think that just turbocharges that issue because instantly you're starting you're starting doing something with the data and before you know it you're in so yes. it's so easy to get sucked in. That's the main message. I'm going to come on to that in a minute about technology. And that's that's the, I think that's the rabbit hole issue about the technology. It just it just makes those risks or 
issues far faster and far quicker right um thank you can i just can i just bring in um earlier when you were talking sort of stepping back a little bit a step back really to that slide that you're just sharing now yeah um, where you were saying you were talking about um you know the presentation that you gave to the community um and that you felt under a lot of pressure um yeah. can i bring in sarah at that point please because i think this is really the point where where her comment is quite useful sarah can you can you um expand on what you're saying you're on mute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. I've done a lot of work with people with autism in residential care um, over many years, and I've been acutely aware of how much the ethical <laughs> um, restrictions are. people in another city, people in a, a place not here. Um, but these are were young men, um, older teenagers in some case, when they first started the work. And, and now they're 20 years on, they're getting towards late middle age. Some of them are massively talented, but they can't make any impression on the world. They can't be present in the world with their art because of um, so-called ethical considerations. And, and I'm not aware that they have a choice in that, really. I think it's so built into the structures of the way they live, that um, the restrictions, that there's no other possibility. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit outside my sphere of research, um, but I think that it, particularly from a practice and research point of view, it's it's essential, isn't it? Because, you know, are you, yeah. are you working with those people as collaborators? Yeah. Uh, and creative Absolutely. collaborators? Um, are you right you know and, and and shouldn't we shouldn't we look to celebrate and publicize their work yes as a result you know um yes <laughs> i'd like to, i'd like to hope that certainly within our bit of the world that um our research education uh, our research ethics committee would be able to make sense of that and come up with a solution <laughs> that's, that's thank a you great that's a very hopeful hopeful yeah. no i think i think it, there is good reason to be hopeful though because yeah. i mean i can see that there are so many different developments around the definition and redefinition of what constitutes a sensitive topic and and you know like um vulnerable participants and and it, there's this development all the time that actually you know what's sensitive in one area is not sensitive in another and who's vulnerable in one area is not vulnerable in another so it really is you know sort of looking at, at ethics on a, on a case to, to case basis. And I do think that there is a, an appetite for that. Um, but I must also say that I'm not exactly the most patient person. And sometimes these changes and these developments are a little bit too slow for my taste. Yes, me too. <laughs> so, yes. So I think it's a case of trying to, to accept that, patient, you know, what you've said, it, you know, is definitely something that's happening, but perhaps it's not quite as, 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 as quick as we would want it to. Great. Ross, well, do you want to continue? Yeah, I will continue. I think I've got about another 10 minutes and then we can have another chat at the end. Um, so I want to I want to talk now about um, what I've called obligations to the deceased. Um, so notwithstanding the lack of legal protection um, for uh, personal information of the deceased, there are some who argue that even those who died long ago have a right to be forgotten. And yet by triangulating online resources such as newspaper databases, I potentially uh, cast what um, Holly Cross and White calls a shaft of brilliant light over what has been in historical darkness. Really nice phrase. So if if, um, if we do uh, want to enter into the spirit of living alongside archival documents uh, in the manner suggested by narrative scholars, such as Barbara Morgan Fleming and colleagues, we're soon confronted with questions regarding the extent to which ethically researchers should afford similar rights to the deceased as they would to the living. Such questions have been considered by the network of concerned historians whose coordinator, Antoon Debates, we find the slide here, yeah, um, has proposed a code of ethics requiring researchers to remain aware of the universal rights of the living and the universal duties to the dead. They should, according to Debets, respect the dignity of the living and the dead as they study. Um, he writes, as part of their right to silence, itself an integral part of the universal right to free expression, historians have the right, after balancing the individual against the public interest, not to disclose historical facts harming the privacy and reputation of persons either living or dead. The balancing test tests 
takes place as follows. In privacy cases, the interests of disclosure and secrecy are of equal importance. In reputation cases, there is a principle, there is in principle a presumption in favour of disclosure. That was his view on it. The um, American Historical Association concurs with uh, this presumption in favour of disclosure, and their ethics code notes that wherever possible, researchers should strive to serve the historical profession's preference for open access. Um, <clears throat> and to uh, the public discussion of the historical record. Uh, nonetheless, when faced with these kinds of dilemmas, some historians of 20th century history have com felt compelled, compelled to anonymize to avoid compromising historical individuals' reputations, particularly when dealing with uh, research that's considered to be controversial. Um, so thinking about my yearbook research, at first glance, again, it's hardly controversial. And yet the nature of the project means that it will be hard to avoid disclosing the names of key individual uh, music educators in that study. I've not yet reached that point, but I'm aware that such dis disclosures need to be carefully considered. Um, in particular, I have no evidence of wrongdoing within the workforce under investigation, but it must be acknowledged that in the past decade, significant historical cases of sexual abuse have come to light within the music education sector. So I need to tread carefully, not least because my ethics approval for this work covers me to disclose um, output in the outputs matters that are already of, his, of public record. But obviously, if I did come across any fresh historical evidence of illegality, I would be legally compelled to disclose it to the relevant authorities. But here's another example of how easy it is with contemporary technology to inadvertently impact on the reputation of a deceased individual. I've mentioned that in both of these projects, I've been using the vast resources of the British newspaper archive um, to trace lives and careers of individuals within the project's scope. And in so doing, um, careful manual cross-referencing still has to be necessary, still is necessary to avoid misconnecting false positives. So reports of multiple individuals whose details matched the search terms. Without such checks, the resulting kind of digital chimera, I've called it, have serious implications for an individual's reputation and legacy, not to mention the quality of the research. So for one example, um, I've got uh, one of the, the, the figures related to the exam project, uh, the exam certificate project, is a music hall artist named Am Ambrose Thorne. And Ambrose actually had quite a high profile career in his day. Um, as you can see, made records, published sheet music and was at the London Hippodrome. Um, but actually researching his life and work as part of this project via digital newspaper archives is not straightforward because there are actually two performers in the same period with the same name. Um, so he only plays a tangential um, role in my research. And so the temptation would have been to just take a explore you know do a cursory investigation and then, uh, you know, move on. But then mistakes could have easily crept in. Um, now, the risk of mixing up individuals' identities has always been present in historical research, but I want to argue that the sheer instantaneous power and range of desk-based research using resources like the British Newspaper Archive or the Times Digital Archive, um, it's highly seductive and convincing, and it makes these kind of mistakes more likely. Um, in contrast, more traditional methods of archival research with physical materials proceed more slowly, necessarily, um, naturally incorporating opportunities for reflection, double checking and, and reconsideration. This is something that um, the Dutch media uh, historian Hoob Weferia has um, considered in relation to online newspaper archives. He's noted that one must acknowledge that there is a difference between the traditional close reading of a limited amount of text and the distant reading of large amounts of data. Solely relying on digital analysis is therefore too limited in scope and even dangerous because it feeds the idea that only information that is instantly available online is relevant. That creates digital laziness, he argues, which is a direct threat to the historical need to critically evaluate all relevant surviving sources and not only the digitally available. The traditional historical guidelines to look carefully and critically at the unique materiality and historical context of sources and not to rely just on one source or method is still relevant, probably more relevant ever. So in a sense, this isn't an ethical issue because it's more of a need for basic historical good practice. But then there are important ethical implications of getting it wrong. One relating to the families and, um, and the reputations of the individual and one related to the, you know, the responsibilities to the historical community. Um, in the former case, um, the wrong Ambrose in my study actually ended up uh, ending his life by throwing himself off cliffs near Brighton in 1931. 
Um, and had I inv inadvertently concluded that this was the fate of my thorn, then the possible implications for his living descendants might have been pretty significant. Um, in relation to the uh, wider historical community, the implications for when things go wrong are also significant, particularly in the age of the internet. An example is Lavinia Goodall, um, remembered as a pioneering female lawyer in the 19th century United States. And one tiny slip with a photograph in 1959 led to museums and exhibitions misidentifying this important individual um, with multiple websites then copying and pasting the erroneous image, widely propagating a mistake which was only discovered in 2014. Um, it's unfortunately it's not easy to put the toothpaste back into the tube. And as Nancy Cop, um, who's noted on the, the relation to the Lavinia uh, Goodall case notes, once erroneous information is on the Internet, it is usually there to stay. Um, so I'm going to conclude by um, just reflecting on a little bit of what I've learned so far, uh, trying to engage with the ethical implications of both these projects. Firstly, I think that they highlight that many research foci have hidden ethical implications, which only come to light part of the way through. It's what Nicholas was talking about. And at the start, uh, you know, an, a, an enthusiastic researcher can rush in equipped with all the powerful tools in the digital toolbox. And as I've been reading around this area, I've been struck at the relatively recent discussion of some of these issues in the historical community, um, in the case of web based databases and tools in particular. It's very much a case that the technology driving historiographical, historiographical practices, in my view, um, and based on my experience, I think it's important to keep the potential risks of this in mind as one progresses throughout a piece of research. And secondly, and not least because this is a practice as research forum, I also want to say how personally involved I've got with both of these projects. In the case of the exam certificate research, many of the events took place in my hometown, as I've mentioned, so I find myself in places directly linked to the story. It's surprising how quickly one feels that, correctly or incorrectly, they know the historical figures they're researching, particularly when one has tangible possessions of theirs, as I do with this the exam certificate. As noted in the case of the, on, of the online obituary, these feelings can be sharply challenged at points. And in the case of the yearbook project, the period of time I'm researching obviously covers the Second World War, and I have to admit to becoming engaged very closely with the names of staff members I read in these volumes during this period. If I notice that a particular individual is away on war service as I go through, I am most concerned to read that they have resumed their old duties in the post-war period, or very saddened to see that these posts remain listed as vacant. These kinds of imaginary relationships between me as a researcher and those historical figures I am researching are surprisingly compelling, and the situation becomes more, more complex once, begin, once one begins engaging with people involved in local history groups who have tangible personal links with some of the individuals. Now, I don't view this kind of personal engagement as particularly problematic in my case. I enjoy being engrossed in my academic work, whether this be teaching, research or even administration. But it does highlight the ethical responsibilities we have to ourselves as historical researchers. And some of us are likely to investigate far more controversial or distressing topics far more than me. And we need to be mindful of how the things we discover might impact on us personally. It's good to plan ahead for these on any research application, I think. And with that, I'm gonna finish. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ross, that's great. Um, um, and, and it's lovely, it's honestly lovely to have heard your final reflections. Um, um, and you get a, 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 a round of applause virtually here as well. Um, can I ask you to stop sharing your screen for a second, please? Yeah. Um, and also there is a comment in the in the chat box, which we um, are going to be um, sort of, you know, sort of picking up on. But I want to tap into that last thing that you said about this being a practice as research um, network um, and how sort of close you were. Um, are you in view of what you've learned so far? Are you sort of trying to in your in your own way would you think that um the ethics process that we have got here at ioe for example where we're saying that everything is research and you therefore have to apply for ethical approval before you do it is that an appropriate way or do you see that there, there is a tension here because potentially you you're on to something and 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 then you realize you're on to something and and that's you know almost too late to apply for ethical approval well, I, I, on the on the topic of the the system we've got at the IOE, um, so I'm a reviewer as well, so I see it from both sides. So obviously, when I'm doing an application, I'm I'm thinking about well, what is a person going to think of this? Is it clear? 
have I explained myself um, sufficiently? And if I am doing something that is not straightforward, which I have found myself doing from time to time, um, I'm, I'm already thinking, well, I've got to get, I've got to get this over. I've got to convey this. So down to me to try and convey this. Um, and I want to help the reviewers out by making it really clear. So in that sense, I don't see it a particular problem. You know, it's, 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 it's a, it's a very useful process to, um, to uh, get your ducks in a line. It's a very useful process to know what you're doing, as I said earlier. But um, on this thing about like realizing down the line you need ethics, I think what we should do though, it's a bit like, you know, I, I think we, not us within the IOE at all, because I think we're lovely supportive people and I'm sure we all are across UCL, but you know, the way that everything has become like you've got to do an ethics application for that you've got to do an ethics application you know there's a ten there's a there's a tendency that i think we if we we ought to be able to admit a mistake we ought to be able to think crikey didn't think this was going to go in this direction it has gone in this direction i'm going to pause but now i need to go and sort out the ethics um and i think that should be okay do you know what i mean i don't think there should be we shouldn't be made to feel pro professionally guilty about taking advantage of avenues and things in our research that take us to unex unexpected places but i think you know i think then it's on us as researchers to be ready to 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 pick those issues up officially but i think also it's on the infrastructure of the ethics approvals to be sensitive to that does that make sense yes absolutely thank you very much i really appreciate that yeah. so there is a comment um nicholas do you want to come in about the right to be forgotten yeah, sure. Um, actually, can I just before I do that? Can I just pick up on that last point? I agree. I think there is a need to to see yes. that to go with the grain of research essentially, and to make institutional processes deal with that. And I think there's an inherent tension in that because institutions are globally are, are kind of concerned with compliance and liability and that sort of thing, which is why they want everything up front. But I mean, that's not really how research goes. So anyway, there's an outstanding challenge there. It's difficult to resolve, but I think it's one that needs to be needs to be acknowledged yeah so the comment i made earlier on um was just when you were talking ross about the um the right to be forgotten i was wondering whether there was also a right to be remembered and i put it in quotes accurately because i mean you know what does what does accurate mean in this in this context but i was thinking particularly in you know, a lot of the source data you're using we might see as to some large degree immutable it's printed it's on paper it's hard to change now but as we move to more and more born digital work um, and we have these online memorials and so on. That's all very mutable data. And so the idea that we can go back and find a historical record that has some provenance that we can trust is, I think, going to get more difficult. Um, and I'm wondering if that's actually going to impact this kind of research in the future, even if it, I mean, I suspect it is to some extent now, but, you know, it's certainly more so in the future. Um, is it going to make this kind of research hard when, if what you're trying to do is come to a I don't want to use the word authoritative because that's too much like other than, you know, but, you know, an appropriate record or interpretation of historical activity or, or people's lives and that sort of thing. Yeah, I don't. I, so I it's difficult to know because, of course, our approach to historical research has been shaped by the tools that we've had so far, um, like birth records and death records and so on. So we've kind of. Um, uh we, we, we kind of that's that's our sort of frame of reference um so lots of times when i've been doing this project i've been thinking to myself well both projects i've been thinking how would someone do this in 50 years time i don't know whether the data will be there in the same way and i don't know whether you know we'll be reconstructing people's lives from tweets or um you know like facebook posts um which have have pros and cons of their own because they they will present as you say a similarly like partial version of of people's lives and people's you know um but i don't think that you could do looking at i mean for instance a lot of the work on the british i mean the british newspaper archive is incredible it's got i mean it's it's actually hard to not find someone it's hard to hard to find someone in you know a historical individual who lived in this country who's not in it in some way whose, whose name is not there because you've got local newspapers going back three centuries um of course we don't have many local newspapers now we don't have those records so will that will the equivalent you know digital things be still there in 50 or 100 years i, I don't i haven't got a clue i don't think they will so um it's very difficult to see what how 
I mean, I'm sure they'll come up with solutions in the future, but I don't know um, from my perspective of how of how it will look. Um, but I think what, what will happen is presumably we'll end up with kind of richer um, profiles of people with video and audio and things, because that's what's available. Um, but whether or not it will be any more accurate than what we've got now, I don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ross. And thank you very much, everybody, for being here. I'm quite aware of the time. So I'm going to carefully wrap this up. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, because clearly there's there's more to be said about that. There's um, a, a couple of more comments. Um, one also about, you know, how it's nice to be able to amend ethics, um, not to, to just have, kind of have to go through the entire full process again, for example. Um, what I'd like to share very quickly um, when I want to share my screen is to kind of make you aware of the next session that's happening on the 7th of December. Um, and it's a different time on this one occasion. It's from 11 a.m. to 12 noon UK time. And it's um, about ethics and ethical re um, considerations in practitioner research with Professor Kate Wall. Um, also, just for the sake of completeness, I'm sharing with you um, the slides and the links that are um, available for you to kind of connect with us with the Practice as Research Network on YouTube, on Buzzsprout, um, on the website. And obviously, this presentation will be on there as well in due course. I hope to get it sorted out over the next few days and then I'm going to be able to share it. So again, thank you very, very much for being here. Ross, um, thank you for, for having um, spent the time um, today with us. And I look forward to connecting with everybody in the, in the near future. Mm -hmm.